we're going to look at steel casting suppliers development and selection and that's a primary distinction that we need to make because if you have a portfolio of two three four steel casting producers who already are qualified to make your product then the selection process is fundamentally different sort of thing than the supplier development so if we look one of the challenges we face as steel casting producers and our customers face as steel casting users is the management notion that steel castings are commodities. And so I wanted to start out by saying that that's just not factually correct. A commodity is something where multiple producers make a standard product and multiple customers can buy it. And so if I'm making railroad couplers, for example, those are standardized by the American Association of Railroad. Lots of foundries can make those particular products. They check them every year to make sure that they're interchangeable. And there are many different companies that buy the coupler parts. And so in that sense, a railroad coupler casting is a commodity. But most of our uh, most of our steel castings are proprietary products they are a unique engineering design for a particular user he's the only customer that uses it it's proprietary to him and so these are really proprietary engineered products and because of that um, there really needs to be an ongoing development relationship between the customer the purchaser and the foundry that produces it because innovations, cost reductions, improvements are going to come out of that partnership. They're not going to come out of some other off the screen activity because someone else is using that component. So first thing I wanted to cover is some of the challenges that face us as steel casting suppliers and our customers as uh, steel casting users. One is the macroeconomic uh, capital investment cycle. There's about a 30 year cycle. We are just at the end of the capital boom, and for the last 20 years or so, up until about 2005, we were in the capital bust phase where we were liquidating the excess. Globalization meant that this time when we went through the capital boom, not much of that was done in North America. So the capacity and capability of, in North America is still somewhat limited. So if you have steel casting requirements, it's going to be really necessary to find good suppliers and develop a, an ongoing productive and profitable relationship with them. And finally, the regulatory burden, that really is one of the reasons that we haven't made the investment in North America. Having said that, with uh, process modeling like MagmaSoft and solidification modeling and the developments of additive manufacturing, steel castings are going to become increasingly a very attractive product form and so if you don't have a good system for developing and using steel castings it's really going to be a challenge as you move forward to have competitive products this shows that capital investment cycle you can see back in the 50s if you look at other product forms they come down from 1950 1950 1980 2010 you're at the peak of the market cycle um, in the 1970s, we had the oil crisis, we had double-digit inflation, we had double-digit interest rates. Those were all accompanied by perception of lack of capacity and pricing that went up almost double digits every year. So there was a huge boom of investment, and that investment ended in 1980, 1981 when the market collapsed. And because of that market collapse, pricing continue to erode for the next 20 years. So you had a 20-year erosion in 1970, you had a 20-year erosion to the year 2000, and then in 2003, the market took off again. This phase here meant that you had fewer foundries, you had an aging workforce, and so now we're looking at a generational change, both in the people using steel castings that don't have that background, and in our own uh, steel casting producers trying to train the next generation. Um, you can see in steel casting production that sharp drop from over 2 million tons in 1979 to around 750,000 tons in 1980. That huge drop meant that we had an ongoing liquidation of the excess capacity up until 2001, when 2001, 2002, 2003, all of a sudden the market just exploded. 
you can see that the capacity went from 2.5 million tons to about 1.5 million tons where it remains. And we've lost a great deal of that capacity, especially in large, technically sophisticated plants. In some ways, that's the result. And of course, you see the number of plants going down. As you know, from manufacturing, every year you have to improve your labor productivity three or four percent. And that means that you increase your capacity uh, and lower your employment over time. And so you can see that we're down to only around 150 plants that make steel sand castings. And a lot of that reinvestment then occurred in China and in Europe and in other places in the world. So we really have a stable market, just like a steel mill industry, and we don't have the full capacity we need. That's one of the artifacts of globalization. So as our customers have looked for global suppliers, they basically have abandoned um, having a multiplicity of suppliers available to them in North America. And so if you look at the steel casting supply, if I'm making production and I have multiple previous successful suppliers, then I don't need to do anything but figure out which one can meet my current commercial requirements. But if I want new suppliers or a new product, then I have to go on a development cycle. And on a development cycle, this requires investment from both sides and really requires a collaborative relationship. When we had too many foundries and they were struggling for the business, then oftentimes those uh, development cycles were one-sided where the, the purchaser held out the carrot that there might be business and the foundry had to make the investment and development. But in today's market, that's not as true. And so if you look at it, if you want new suppliers, if you want to qualify suppliers, the best way to do it is find somebody who's already in your business. How can I find somebody who's already making this kind of part? Now at Steel Founders Society, we do a lot of economic analysis. So we've had to come up with sort of a taxonomy or a system of categories to look at plant. And we have six or seven categories. You may want to develop a different category. We have railroads, uh, mining, jobbing shops, stainless foundries, which are small induction, no-bake shops. The jobbing shops can be large, art melting, uh, chemically bonded sands. Railroad tends to be green sand, high volume production, mining. Uh, has a special processes like V processes as well as no bake. All of these are different sort of market segments. And if you're looking at suppliers, if you're in the railroad business, you want somebody who's certified by AAR. If you're in jobbing or mining, if they work for Caterpillar or they work for Komatsu or they work for Harnischweger or any number of people, you can know that they have that capability. If you're looking at stainless or pumps and valves, then you really want somebody who's qualified to ASME, maybe somebody who's been certified by Emerson. And then if you're making uh, shipbuilding parts, there's the American Bureau of Shipping. If you're making oil field complex parts, NORSOC, there's a pressure equipment development. Those are the kinds of qualifications you want to look for if you're trying to qualify and develop a new supplier. Under the development, there needs to be a collaborative relationship, and there you run into the problem of single source versus multiple sourcing. If you have a single source, that means you both have an investment, but you're heavily dependent on that single source, but both of you are committed to each other, and so that gives you that advantage and disadvantage. And in small and medium-sized companies, this is the typical procedure. In larger corporations, they want multiple sources, and multiple sources do give you market pressure, and backup in case one supplier fails, but it means that the supplier has less of a commitment, makes less of an investment, unless there's a long-term contract or a, a non-traditional sort of arrangement. If I'm making parts for somebody who's got multiple sourcing, why would I work on the product design? Because I'm not gonna be able to recover that because if I include it in my piece price, then somebody who gets the design after I help develop it is gonna be able to make that part without making the investment. Why should I contribute my best ideas? Oftentimes when I go to someone and they say they're interested in me as an alternative supplier, they're really just trying to get me to make a lower price and give them some innovative ideas to share with their current supply base so that they get the benefit of my ideas without me getting any business. So this is a real challenge for us. And historically, there were too many steel foundries. So now a steel foundry to be successful has to be as picky at uh, selecting its customers as our customers have to be in selecting the right steel foundry.
if you look at supplier qualification, unqualified suppliers, people that you just are on the bid list because the purchasing department thinks anybody who says that they can make the part can make the part and meet the specifications. Unqualified suppliers either bid too high or too low. Actually, the too high people often don't bid because they don't think it's worth their time. And it's no big deal. They're not going to get the order, but they may be the exact people you want to have as suppliers. They may have the technology, the quality requirements and everything else, but they don't see any reason or potential business. So if you're looking for suppliers, you need to find the people who really already had the quality systems and the technology to support your thing. If it's too low, it's really a bad deal for everybody. They get the order because the purchasing department's gonna get a bonus at the end of the year, but they can't make the part. That gives you delays and quality problems with the parts they think. And then that anchors the price expectation at the purchasing department too low so that real suppliers who are capable of making that part can't meet that pricing target. And so one of the things you can look at is the potential suppliers are actually on our SFSA website directory um, if you're looking for suppliers and some of their qualifications. One of the most critical things that we ignore is in all manufacturing, we've had a complete generational change in the last five years. So does the potential steel casting supplier have the staffing that meets your needs and requirements? And that's a real challenge because ordinarily we only work through sales and purchasing, but to really have a useful development thing, we need coordination in production and technical and engineering and shipping and receiving inspection and quality all of those staffing functions need to be talking to each other if we're going to have an effective partnership to develop the part and the process to meet the quality and cost goals and that requires clear communication so global supply it makes it challenging culturally and language and location there's a rule of thumb internationally that you really find it difficult to source castings more than a thousand kilometers from your plant and here is just a short list of the technical requirements that I think are really the essential requirements that you want to discuss. And this will show you whether or not the steel foundry you're working with needs a, a lot of work to become qualified or is almost qualified already. For example, in melting, do they have a melt procedure for the alloys? Is their furnace big enough? Do they have a heat treat procedure and tests showing that they meet the requirements? Do they have PQRs and WPSs that meet the quality and code requirements that you need? Those are things that show that they already have most of the internal staffing and process and equipment requirements to actually meet your needs. One of the challenges we face is on all castings. This is steel castings. This is other castings. This is scrap and customer rejects. This is from the Ann Arbor benchmarking study. If you look on the median values, it's all around 1%. So when I ship you a casting that's unmachined, typically 1% of them are returns back to me because you find porosity. And so really, if you want to avoid and, and have steel foundries meet the requirements the way all your other suppliers do, you need to have the casting supplied in the machine state. Because if they are, then steel foundries can meet the ordinary quality expectations. But no one, this is some of the best foundries, nobody can really do better than a 1% return because there's no inspection techniques that let me find the porosity or inclusions that are going to be on the machine surface. There's no process technology that eliminates them. And so the only way to find them is to do the machining. So these are the ordinary supplier qualifications. And these are some of the, they're necessary, but they're some of the least important things making sure that the process type meets your dimensional standards and quality standards, making sure that the molding, melting, crane moving, heat treatment all can handle the size and volume you need, that your economic order quantities fit the profile of the supplier, that the equipment can meet the production rate, that they can inspect and finish to your requirements. You also normally do a financial evaluation, and this also is not very critical. It, they need to be financially stable, but financially stable companies can still be not capable of making your products. And of course, as suppliers, we're really wary of purchasers that have a failing supply chain. When our major customers have foundries that clearly don't quite meet their technical requirements, but they're happy to use that foundry because of the low price, 
and that low price causes them to go out of business, that hurts our industry because that sets a pricing expectation that's too low and gives us a bad quality reputation. So we really want an ongoing partnership with our customers so that we can make the best quality products that meet and exceed their expectations for performance and cost and they can be happy with the steel castings and use innovative designs to get the maximum benefit.